Uh, so I have had the pleasure of working for 25 years in understanding people's attitudes and opinions. And about 15 years ago, we did a study on attitudes to immigration, where we also asked a question where we got people to estimate what the actual level of immigration was in Britain. And people were incredibly wrong. So they, they overestimated by two or three times the actual level. And it made me think two things. First of all, is immigration the only thing that we get wrong in terms of perception versus reality? And then second thing was, is it just Britain that's uniquely rubbish at this? Or does it happen all around the world? And so that was the start of the perils of perception studies. So we've, since then, we've done dozens of studies, over 100,000 interviews across 100 different topics, and up to 40 uh, countries. Very simple premise. We just get people to guess at realities, look at the gap between the two, uh, and then try to understand both why and then what we can do about it. That's kind of the whole principle for it. So the best way to do this is just to ask you the questions. I'm such an obsessive about people's opinions and attitudes that I can't help, can't stop myself from asking people, even up here. I'm going to ask you these uh, questions, just three questions to illustrate three different sorts of effects. And this is the first one. This is kind of a typical example. Uh, so what percentage of women and girls aged 15 to 19 in your country do you think give birth each year? That's what we'd ask. And this was asked across about uh, 30 countries. But let's just do it for Britain, since we're in uh, Britain. Just uh, shout out an answer. What percentage of women and girls aged 15 to 19 uh, in Britain do you think give birth each year? Just shout it out, nice and loud, because it's a very big room. Five, 15, eight, 10, 20, 3, 0.5. So you really don't have a clue. You're all over, you're, you're all over the place. Uh, well done if you went pretty low in that. It's actually 1.4%. Uh, 1.4% 1 .4 teenage girls give birth each year. 2% in the US, 6 in Argentina, a bit higher there, but 2% overall around the world. This is a rare event. It's a rare occurrence. But you wouldn't think that when you look at people's guesses, average guesses around the world. These are the average guesses, the mean guess. So 19%, 24%, 37% in Argentina, 37%, uh, and about a quarter overall. So when you think about that, it's slightly absurd. So in an all-girl class of 30, that would be six girls giving birth every single year, six baby showers every single year in, 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 these, in these classes. It gives these enormous gaps between perceptions and uh, reality. So the question is why? Uh, and a big part of it is the vivid emotional stories that we remember. So we, all those things about us being storytelling animals are true. We are drawn to the vivid and unusual. In this case, the social psychologists call the effect emotional innumeracy. So we have an emotional reaction to these types of things. And it means literally that we overestimate what we worry about as much as worrying about what we overestimate. So cause and effect run in both directions. We think something is bigger in our brains because we're worried about it. Um, and because we're drawn to these vivid, unusual stories, that's what the media uh, give us because uh, they know what we like as storytelling animals. So they give us more of that. So that means things like, I guarantee you will never see a headline uh, like this. Uh, the editors won't choose it because they know that we don't really want to read about it. Um, so that's kind of that's one of the, the key effects. There is a second one in overestimating teenage pregnancies is we're useless at spotting slow positive changes. And so if you've seen the work of Hans Rosling, Stephen Pinker, Max Rosa in the UK, this is a similar sort of point to this. This is the trends in birth rates per thousand females aged 15 to 19 in the US across different ethnic groups. But it's the same in other countries, this enormous decline in teenage births from 1990 up to 2014, more than halved over that type of period. The same in loads and loads of different countries, same, same pattern, but we don't notice those small incremental improvements, because it doesn't get reported so much, but it, we're also not, our attention is not drawn uh, towards those types of things. Instead, we tend to focus on negative information, and this was shown in a great series of experiments by US professor John Cassiopo and his team, where he got a series of images that were positive, images that were negative, wired people up to MRI scanners, measure brain activity to see how intensely and where the brain reacted. And uh, so he had a series of positive images first, which this was an American experiment, so the positive images were things like pizza, pizza, 
and Ferraris were the two uh, positive images. Uh, and uh, the negative images were things like mutilated faces and dead cats. See, it always gets that reaction, a sort of slight uh, uh, repulsion at that kind of idea. So let me, before we go any further, let me just reassure you that that cat is not dead. <laughs> it's just resting. Uh, because I had to look at lots of pictures of dead cats for this presentation, um, and I couldn't show them to you because they do react to it in a more visceral way when you do see those types of things. It, it, the, the experimental pictures that he used, I couldn't show in this type of thing because that would be the only thing you remember from this presentation. I, I would be the dead cat guy, <laughs> and that's all, that's all you would take from this. Uh, so it's kind of a live example of how these effects work. We are drawn more to these negative uh, images, and that's like not a dumb fault of our brain. It's actually evolutionary. So when we were cave people, uh, negative information was often threat-based information. So if you didn't act on it, if you didn't act on the warning of the saber-toothed tiger lurking behind the bushes, you were literally edited out of the gene pool. So uh, we are the long line of descendants of uh, a successful species that has paid a lot of attention to negative information. So that's how our brains uh, work. So vivid negative stories, unusual stories are unusual. This is the kind of first lesson. Remember that they are unusual. And things that, what that means is things are literally not as bad as you think just because of the way our brains work. So that's point one. Point two, uh, illustrated by this question, do you think the murder rate in your country is higher, lower, about the same as it was in 2000? Let's do it for Britain again. Just shout out, higher, lower, lower. lower. Same, same, but mostly the lower, because you've got the theme of the presentation already. <laughs> I've, I've, I've kind of given it away. But it is, it is a lot lower, 29%. 29%, which is coincidentally is the same across 30 countries. This is a worldwide trend of declining murder rates over time. But that is not the general perception. So the red bar is a percentage of people who said higher, blue bar is a percentage of people who said lower. So across the world, <clears throat> only 15% of people think the murder rate is lower, even though it's down a lot, and about half uh, think it's higher. So we've got this sense of things are getting worse. And again, shown by a brilliant series of experiments by a different US professor called Terence Mitchell, who did it in a much nicer way than these kind of murder uh, questions. He, what he did was he interviewed people before their holidays, during their holidays, and then after their holidays, kind of tracking the same people over time. What you found is we go in the same sort of average pattern. So we start with a sense of excited anticipation before we go on holiday. We get there, and things, not everything goes quite right. There's a reality of minor niggles when you're on holiday. So some things end up going wrong, and you return with a sense of mild disappointment uh, when you get back. Uh, not just at being back, but about the holiday itself. But that wasn't the purpose of his experiment. The purpose of his experiment was to keep interviewing people for a long time after their holiday. And what he found, again, we all go in the same sort of pattern, is that the further away you get from the holiday, the more fond your memory grows of it. Um, because you literally forget the bad bits, and you remember the good bits. So you forget the kids being sick in the car, and you just remember the lovely walks on the beach, the lovely sunsets, those types of things. Again, this isn't a dumb fault of our brain. Um, this is healthy to let go of minor niggles, things that went wrong in the past. Uh, but it does have a downside, a serious downside, which means that we are more susceptible to believe that things are getting worse, which politicians, the media, other kind of actors play on. Our natural sense of things are going downhill. Uh, and as you can imagine, in a book <clears throat> on misperceptions, Donald Trump features a lot throughout the book on misperceptions and misdirection. And this is something that he said seven or eight times on the campaign trail in 2016. Uh, the murder rate in our country is the highest it's been in 47 years, right? And you won't hear the press saying that. And there was a very good reason you wouldn't hear the press <laughs> saying that, because it's just not true. Uh, the murder rate over that kind of period was about half the level 40, now as compared to 47 years ago. There had been a slight uptick in American cities, but over that kind of period, massively down, uh, not up. So that sense of playing on our sense of uh, things going downhill is a very, very important effect. So for us, second lesson from this 
is to remember that the past was not as rosy as we remember it, again, literally. Uh, and that means, very importantly, that the present and future are not as bad as we think. It's not as bad as we think. Again, a kind of very literal. Final effect, a uh, different kind of environment for this. Uh, it's seen in lots of different subjects, but just picking out one. Uh, this was uh, a question we asked about Facebook users. Out of every 100 people aged 13 and over in your country, about how many do you think have a Facebook account? And since you've got quite a lot of this correct uh, or close so far, we're not going to ask about Britain. Let's ask about India. Indian Facebook use, which seems a very unfair question, but I'm going to do it anyway. Facebook, what percentage of Indians aged 13 and over living in India uh, do you think have a Facebook account? Shout out. 35, 10, 5, 6, 20. Wow, this is really good. I think 60, not so good. <laughs> but very pertinent, as I'll show you, actually, because it's actually about 18% at the time of the study. It's gone up a bit since, but it was about 18%. But these were the guesses in the different countries. 64% was the guess, the average guess, in India. Um, so this is where I have to tell you a bit about the design of the surveys, uh, because all of these surveys are done online with people. So people with, who, by definition, have internet access, who themselves then are much more likely to have Facebook access, who their friends and family are much more likely to have Facebook access. So a more affluent middle class Indian population, which might seem like a fault, a flaw in the survey, but actually very useful for this uh, type of experiment. Because what it shows is, is we generalize from our own direct experience, from the own little bubble that we're in. These kind of bubbles that we live in are not just to do with our online uh, lives, it's to do with who we mix with, who we talk to, and that sense of polarization that Herb mentioned is true. So what the social psychologists call this is uh, what we see is all there is effect. And it's a very powerful effect. Of when we get into our little bubbles, we think uh, that's all there is, and that's representative. But one of the key messages from the book and from this uh, presentation is we're not as normal as we think. Um, it's a really powerful effect, very hard to resist, uh, but it's uh, true and uh, something to resist. Uh, so, finally, just then to sum up, um, <clears throat> one thing that I did in the book was to look all the way back to 1940s America. There's some que similar questions that ask about social realities back then. Uh, and what that shows is we were just as wrong, people were just as wrong in the US in the 1940s about things like immigration, unemployment levels, those types of things, as we are now. So there is this temptation to think this is a brand new uh, thing, that we've got a lot of focus on alternative facts, uh, fake news, post-truth, but this is something much more systemic. This is built into the way we think, and it's built into the media environment that we get. So we've got to be mindful of that. Having said that, there is something more dangerous about our current information environment in terms of uh, reinforcing people's incorrect views of the world. And it's not so much that we're changing people's perceptions and people are getting more wrong. It's just, as Herb mentioned, that we're getting more certain of our views and more certain, most importantly, that the other people are wrong. That kind of sense of polarization is a really important factor, that we think we're correct, the other side is wrong, and that's a danger. So, but just to leave you with three optimistic points about this, things to bear in mind. First of all, the world is currently better and getting better uh, than we think, just literally. And that doesn't mean to say everything's perfect or there's not more that we could do to make things uh, better, but it's a really important message because it fights against that tendency to think things are terrible and going downhill. Because all that does is leave space for people who want to rip up the system for their own ends. We've got to keep hold of that, that sense. The second thing is, whenever you show these types of uh, experimental work, it makes you think, God, do we have any control over our thoughts at all when we've got all these biases? Uh, but what you see is, uh, when you look into the data, these are average effects. So we're not automatons. We're not determined by uh, these effects entirely. We do have free will. And I see it a lot in my day-to-day -day work, where we get people together in citizens' assemblies and things like that. And people do take on new information, do change their minds, and do talk across the divides when you get them in the right sort of environment. So we shouldn't be too downhearted about polarization. But third and final point, point and the only thing that you've really got to remember, if there's only one thing you remember from this, 
It's that the cat is <laughs> alive <laughs> and well. Thank you very much. <laughs>